I knew it. I knew it going in, and I was right. For those who aren't watching this through the Amino app, I posted some polls on the Gravity Rush and Crash Bandicoot Aminos a while back. In those polls, I asked if people would like me to make videos relating to the lore of their respective universes. And wouldn't you know it, the polls came up with a nearly unanimous yes. At least on the Gravity Rush one. The Crash Bandicoot poll was more leaning toward maybe than yes. But I'll take it. I was pretty certain going in that the polls would be met with a yes. Which is not to say I'm disappointed. I absolutely wanted people to vote in favor of these videos. So to everyone watching this, thank you. This is for you. The lore videos were inspired by a combination of boredom and watching similar content from VTN Vivi and Arch Warhammer. Vivi posts lore about Sly Cooper, Ratchet and Clank, and Jack and Daxter, while Arch, as his name suggests, posts lore videos about Warhammer Fantasy and Warhammer 40k. Links to their channels in the description, although beware that Arch is absolutely NSFW. Warning, there will be spoilers for the games, so if you haven't played them, you may wish to skip this video. This is your last and only warning. Okay then, on we go. Getting back to my original point, I enjoy watching Vivi and Arch, and eventually got inspired to do something similar. So I decided to make lore videos about my own favorite franchises. Hopefully I can do them justice, because both Gravity Rush and Crash Bandicoot mean a lot to me. So without further ado, let's take a look at some of the mythology behind Gravity Rush. The video game starring everyone's favorite super-powered hobo, Cat. The city of Hexavi is an amazing place. It's divided into four sections, each completely distinct from one another. Old Noir, the Old Town, Plejun, the Entertainment District, Industria, the Industrial District, and Von Centre, the Downtown. I am not sure how a place can be called Downtown when your city is divided into four hubs, each located in a circle around a central pillar, but I'm not a city planner, so what do I know? Old Noir is a very calm, low-key zone. Landmarks include the famous fountain in the town square, and the park off to the side of the area, which you might forget exists. The park even hosts a church at the top of a small rise. So presumably some of these people are religious, though what deity they worship, if their religion includes a deity, is unknown. Said park also includes a fish statue, which at one point held a sacred gem, which itself was believed to be older than Hexavi and acted as a form of protection for the city's residents. Cat's house is located in this area as well. Speaking of which, Cat's house happens to be in a sewer pipe, because she's a hobo and can't afford rent. Hey, don't worry too much, Cat. Maybe the Thieves' Guild has an operation going down there. I hear they pay 500 gold per job. Plejeune is the place you go to hang out and find entertainment. The music amps up considerably, sounding as though it should be in some 40s bar or something. Plejeune is home to a number of sites. You've got the Ferris Wheel, which is one of the highest points in the district. You've got Pandora's Fortunes, where you go to have your fortune told. And finally you have the Archibus Academy, the local school. At first, it seems a bit odd to locate a school in an entertainment district, but upon further analysis, it's actually brilliant. Think about it. Yes, there is the risk that students will ignore their studies and run off to the nearest bar. But it's worth the risk because you want your students to bond with one another and have somewhere to go in their off time. And where better to do that than the entertainment district? You could locate the college somewhere else, but then the students would have to pay railway fares to get to Plejeune, which would drive up their costs, which itself would mean the college would have fewer students, and therefore less income. 
Andostlia, as the name implies, is the industrial center of Hexivy. Or rather, it was, before it was reduced to a ruin inhabited only by the city's forest citizens. Originally built to serve as a supply depot and a way to shield Hexivy against gravity storms, Andostria fell into decay sometime between the two games. Exactly what happened is not known, although it may have something to do with the city's new mayor, Brahmin. I may wind up doing a video on Brahmin in the future if this lore series is popular enough. But for now, let's focus on what we have. The last district of Hexivy is Vaughncentre, the so-called downtown hub of the city. This is where you go if you need help with politics or finances. The mayor's office is located here, and the various mayors throughout the series are seen holding speeches in Vaucentre. The most famous landmark of Vaucentre would undoubtedly be the clock tower, which stands proudly above the rest of the buildings in the district. Fun fact, if Cat flies up to the bell, she can ring it. I love it when developers put in those details. Right below the clock tower is the Central Park, which is used as a gathering place, as well as a place for people to simply stroll around. There are many confectionery stands in Von Centre, and most, though not all, of them are located inside the park. The district also has the most active transportation line, with both gondolas attached to aerial lines and a railway all to itself. The latter is particularly significant because there are railways between other sections of the city, but only Von Centre boasts a railway all to itself. In practice, this does seem a bit redundant when you consider that flying cars are part of Hexavy society, although it may be that the public railway system is simply cheaper for many who can't afford one of the cars. For some reason, the sky in each of the four districts is a different color. Old Noir's sky is a golden orange, Plejeune's is a dark purple, Andrasria's is greenish yellow, and Von Centre's is pale green. If you travel up the world pillar, the sky turns blue, while near the bottom it becomes a blood red. This suggests that each district produces some sort of air pollution unique to that district which contains properties unto itself that include changing the sky to a particular color. Whereas near the bottom of the pillar, there's a different sort of particle in the air. Or perhaps the light is bent in such a way that it's red shifted. This will make more sense in a moment. Hexavy has a very unique design. It's an entire city surrounding the Great World Pillar, and is supported by a network of metal beams attached to said World Pillar. You may have noticed these whenever you fall past the city streets into everything underneath them. Thankfully, these beams aren't the only thing supporting the city's weight. If they were, they'd buckle and collapse, sending the entire city plunging into the gravity storm far below. I don't care how well you tempered your metal, if you put enough pressure on it, it's going to bend. Obviously, the beams would not be enough to support the city. But we know from playing the game that, well, they're not. The gems we collect are used as fuel. As a matter of fact, they seem to have some gravity manipulation properties in and of themselves, as evidenced by the way they refill Cat's gravity meter and well, can be found simply floating in the air. The architects of Hexavy must have, prior to the city's construction, found some way to utilize the gem's inherent properties to their full capacity. We know for a fact that repulsor lift technology is ubiquitous in the city. Much of the local travel is done by the aforementioned flying cars. Now we're getting to it. It's a bit more obvious in Gravity Rush 2, but the gems are used as fuel for repulsor lifts. These devices can be shrunken down to a size just right for a single vehicle, or they can be designed to be large enough to hold entire buildings, even networks of streets, in the air for indefinite periods. 
Ultimately, Kat is not only saving the city by exterminating Nevi, but is also partially responsible for keeping it airborne. The gems she collects are going to power the repulsor lifts keeping Hexavia aloft. And now we come to a bit of a tangent in this discussion. Hexavi does not appear to be located on a planet at all, but rather above a black hole. At the bottom of the world pillar, you find that it's a sort of massive tree with roots dangling just above a swirling vortex of gravity energy, which is in fact a black hole. This is the reason there's a time dilation effect depending on your altitude. At the bottom of the pillar, time flows unimaginably slowly, while at the top, it flows... well... normally, for lack of a better word. In Hexavi, roughly halfway down, it flows slowly, but not nearly as slowly as at the bottom. It's commonly thought by the people at the top of the pillar that the gravity storm at the bottom is rising. It isn't. The world pillar is slowly being pulled into the black hole. This becomes a rather moot point at the end of Gravity Rush 2, due to Gat's sacrifice, but now we're left wondering just what happens to everything else, since there's nothing holding the world of Gravity Rush together anymore. It's magic. Definitely magic. Okay, maybe there is some logic to be had. Presumably, all the matter that the black hole dragged around it is now condensing into some sort of nebula. The whole time, it's dragged enough matter into the local area to provide a breathable atmosphere, and now, even in its absence, there's enough... well... gravity from all the matter it pulled together to provide a stable center of mass and keep the atmosphere around it. Presumably, the black hole smashed enough matter together to leave some black dwarf star in its wake because there's still enough gravitational pull to provide a definite sense of downward drag. Otherwise, the world pillar would float off in some random direction, with the atmosphere eventually flinging itself outward into space. And the good people of Hexavi would be left spacewalking, asphyxiating, bloated, exposed to radiation, and have their innards voided from their bodies. And with that lovely image burned forever into your brains, I will conclude this video. Please do not hesitate to let me know what you think of this lore series in the comments section. I'm eager to see what you guys want from me in addition to my regular reviews. Hopefully this video will be followed by more just like it. That's all for now, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode of Lords of the PlayStation.